<sighs> it's um, Joe Beam's birthday today, so the background music is um, Elian Elias sings Joe Beam. Um, read adjustment stuff, quick video, try to keep it short. Um, I learned most of this stuff um, from books like Larry Teal, Art of Saxophone Playing. Um, also, certainly, um, David Liebman's um, Developing a Personal Saxophone Sound has a great um, wealth of information about anything to do with tone production. He talks about read process. Um, essentially, I guess what I would do, um, especially when I was playing more classical, was following along like the kind of Joe Allard type teachings or um, Harvey Patel. So my saxophone professor, um, wonderful saxophonist, Dr. Dan Goble, uh, I pretty much ev everything that I know about how to make a good sound on the saxophone I learned from him and read adjustment stuff. I mean, he was a great mentor, a great teacher. If you go through Ch Teal's book, he even has charts to talk about the different um, read components, um, specifically um, what parts of the read that you would make adjustments on. This is a great chart. I'm going to PD up a couple pages here. Um, and it really um, is helpful when you're trying to tweak and especially balance your reads, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. So I'm preparing reads. The first thing that I do, and I've pre-soaked a few of these, is I soak them. Um, really read auditioning. I call it a read auditioning process. When all my reads are, are bad and I can't find anything that plays the way I want it to, what I basically do is kind of start over, regroup. I get a bunch of reads and I pretty much take an entire session and all I do is play reads. <laughs> Boring as that sounds. It's a good, you know, on a Saturday night over a mug of beer or over a cup of um, cappuccino in the morning, it's a great activity. What, what basically this involves is you soak the reeds, not too long, I don't like them waterlogged. Um, you know, it's not like David Sanborn where they sit in the jar all the time. Um, a couple of these are pretty wet. Um, a couple of these are older too. And anyway, I get the reeds, um, they're soaked. Then I'll play test them. Um, which is basically just playing a little bit on each read. Um, I'll, I'll do a, a bit later where I do a couple of the play test things. And especially what I want to find out is if the read is too soft. Um, it's funny, if you look at some of my reads, I, I've started to go back to something I used to do when I played classical a lot, which is I actually put marks on the reads. You can see they have a little S on them. That means they're soft. Um, which pretty much means I don't really want to play them. I'm not throwing them away. I never throw away a playable read. Um, I mean, not for a long time. I don't. I keep them. But if they're too soft, um, for the given mouthpiece, it tends to become more pitchy, which I'm already struggling a little bit with pitch as it is. So that I'll put those aside, and I'll find ones that are more suitable candidates. Um, at the end of the process, maybe I get five or six playable reads um, I have a reed guard that holds four reeds for alto. It's just a cheap Rico reed guard or Vito, I guess. And um, anyway, you know, I have those reeds. Once I have a group of playable reeds, I rotate them. So, you know, they're numbered one, two, three, and four. What I'll end up doing is best one is number one, second best number two, and so on. I'll usually play two through four the most, and I kind of rotate. But then when I want to record something or have, you know, a better quality, if I was actually playing somewhere, I would, number one would be the one I would go to. But then it's, you always have the other ones at the ready. So it's weird with weather and humidity and stuff. I've gone into some place and the number one read was like funky in the room. And then you go to like two or three and then maybe number three plays the best. Well, then that's the one you play. So um, imagine most saxophonists go through this kind of a process where essentially you have a group of playable reeds um, at any point in time you know you can do that so um, I, I play a bit on them um, I break them in um, before I really start messing with the reeds I try to break it in a little I mean maybe it's just like a half hour an hour's amount of playing I wouldn't necessarily start working on them the same day that I, I pulled them out of the box and first tested them um, Tools and tools of um, trade as far as adjustments for me. Uh, reed knife, which I don't really use a lot anymore. Sandpaper, it's a little more forgiving. Um, a flat piece of sandpaper um, on a flat surface. This isn't really a good flat surface. 
Um, a lot of people use like a sheet of glass. Um, I have a kitchen table that's made out of Formica that has a very good flat surface. I'll actually do my work in the kitchen usually. So what I do, I get a new reed, um, and I'm going to really start playing it. First thing I do is I'll sand the table flat, just a couple strokes. And what I'll do is I'll start it about here. So I don't want to really touch the tip too much, but I'll push down pretty good and just push it a couple of strokes. That makes the table completely flat. I flip the sandpaper over um, and I rub it back and forth. Um, I rub it back and forth, I don't know, 10 or 15 seconds. Puts a little bit of a sheen on there. It kind of seals it, um, which helps the reed last longer, I think. Um, some guys will seal the top the same way. I've seen people use sandpaper. You could use um, the manila folder. Actually, it would work pretty good. Um, but definitely, it, it, that helps seal the reed. The next thing I do is I balance the reed, which means I put the reed on the saxophone. I'll demo this later. And I'll take the saxophone, play open C sharp, tilt the horn one way, tilt the horn the other way, uh, back and forth a couple times. One side will feel stuffier or more resistant than the other. Um, the side that's, that's stuffier, what you end up doing is you take your um, reed knife or sandpaper, and if I do the sandpaper, I, I put it around my, my finger, and you just do this portion of the reed, the top above my index finger, that's the portion of the reed just along the outside, maybe an eighth of an inch in or a little more than that. So you scrape it a few times on the side that's resistant, try it again. Um, still stuffy, scrape it a few more times, I mean, maybe I do eight strokes or something before I test it again. Um, that's really pretty much what I do for balancing. Um, there's some more fine tuning you can do on a reed. If the entire reed is hard, um, it's just the whole thing. You, like you, especially low register response. Well, there's two things you can do. You can remove some bark on the lower part um, near the vamp, on the outside edge again, um, into maybe about a third of the way into the center, and um, play it again. Um, sometimes that'll free it up. Also, the low notes can be out of balance too. Play like low C or low B flat. You do the same play test, and you'll find out even on the low notes the part of the reed that vibrates more with the low notes is out of balance, well then you can tweak that. You get into classical playing, it's amazing how much stuff like that helps. Especially you're probably playing on a three and a half Van Dorn or a number four even, and you know you got it on your C double star, C star. Um, you know, you start playing something like Glazunov or whatever, you need to have that reed balance both for the middle register and the lower register. Um, you know, Paul Creston, any of those great pieces, your etudes, and, and it's going to make a huge difference overall. Um, you know, it, it's weird. Um, an out of focus read just sounds kind of fuzzy all the time. It's not necessarily a bad sound, depending on the degree of out of balance you have. But, you know, when it's noticeable, like if you do a recording and it's noticeably out of balance, you want to tweak the read. So that's what I do. I'll do the play test in, in a minute. So I have my reed queued up on here. Um, tip of the reed is, is pretty much even with the tip of the mouthpiece. I might even have it a little above right now. I might want to move it down. Um, I have the ligature just a tiny bit below the vamp. It's interesting. I think every mouthpiece has a sweet spot for ligature placement. Well, typically, it plays a little more resistant when you have the um, the ligature all the way down, um, maybe it helps keep the tip more open. I'm not sure about the, the mechanics of it. Sometimes I'll get a read where it, it starts to pull away a little bit and I'll move the ligature up, you know, just to, just to the edge of the vamp too. Um, same with the reed placement on the mouthpiece. Um, if you move the reed down from the tip just a hair, you can start to get a little bit more of an edginess. It, it'll almost play a bit softer, it, depending on the amount of tip um, surface you have to work with, too. Um, but I talked about balancing earlier, so here's, here's the balancing test. Um, this is a soft reed. I think it's balanced. I'm not sure. Um, but it's like this. First, you do the center. 
So the side that's lifted is the side that's vibrating. Basically, when you turn when you turn the horn, it closes off the side that's down on your lip. So middle again. Right. Left. Now you can hear, I can clearly feel it, the left side is freer. So actually this reed is out of balance right now on this mouth. It, it's a little stuffier on the right. I'm not going to mess with it because I know it's a soft reed and I don't like it that much. But you would do that, you would adjust the reed. I never adjust the reeds on the mouthpiece. So that's that play test. My, my play test for strength, it's kind of annoying, but I'll play on low B flat. And I'll take a lot of mouthpiece. And basically, I want to see at what point the B flat breaks up. stuff to it. It played softer the other day. Sometimes reeds are weird. You put it away and you pick it up on a different day and it'll play differently. But when I first was testing a bunch of these reeds, the ones that I marked soft, if you play a low B flat, um, like fortissimo, um, it would just break up all over the place. Um, and basically, if, if, the reed, if the reed breaks up that much, I know it's not going to be hard enough. The other place you'll notice the reed hardness is um, high notes. Um, you know, it, it, what, the reed will tend to close up faster on the, like, high F, high, you know, an altissimo register stuff. You know, so you can also test it that way. Um, this, reed, this reed plays decent in the high register. Actually, this isn't a terrible reed. Um, but in any event, um, I don't know, maybe I'll balance it and stick it back in my own. Um, in my pile of, to work with, but um, that's kind of what you get. So I'm going to balance this thing right now. I want to see how it'll really play. I might turn off my background music. So balancing the reed. I tend to like to do my reed adjustments when the reed is a little moist. I don't like to adjust dry reeds so much um, because you really, you can't quite see what I'm doing, you really want to be able to um, test it and see where it's at. Yeah, probably the most important things that you do working on a reed would be making sure it's sealed flat to the table, but um, you, you, know, you, you adjust it and you play test it again. And I'll see what it sounds like when I balance it, or when I, when I test the balance. <laughs> So there you go. Um, <clears throat> I don't really have anything else. Cheers. <laughs>